poet like Rita Dove, a poet who is a fierce and eloquent spokesperson for her art. She is a Pulitzer Prize winner, an honorary doctorate 22 times over, the Chancellor of the American Academy of Poets. She was the Poet Laureate of the United States by the time she was 40, and has served twice in that capacity, making her one of the most vibrant defendants of poetry and poets that I can think of. Most important, however, is the poetry itself. And Rita has written many, many volumes of it, lyrical, potent, filled with grace and imagery that is quite unlike anything else in our American language. Her latest book is called Sonata Mulatica, a suite of poems about George Holgren Bridge Tower, a biracial violin prodigy well known to Thomas Jefferson and Beethoven, but forgotten in the fog of time. Rita Dove is the Commonwealth Professor of English at the University of Virginia. I had the great privilege of working with Rita when she was a columnist for the Washington Post. She was one of the captains and commanders of a remarkable moment in journalism called Poet's Choice, the only regular feature in a major American newspaper dedicated to poetry. It is a pleasure to be able to welcome her back to the Washington Post and send her on to her first appearance at the National Book Festival. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Rita Dove. I am not a morning person, I have to say that right off the bat. And I wanted to thank everyone for coming. This is really, really great. Uh, I love this festival already. I'd like to talk a little bit about that book, Salam Melodica, because um, poetry is a strange and mutable thing. And if someone had asked me when I was five what I wanted to be, I, I wouldn't have known that I wanted to be a poet, though that's what I wanted to be. <coughs> All my life, I've been confronted with variations of that old line, what's a nice girl like you doing in a place like this? <laughs> and early on it was, what are you doing in the orchestra playing cello? Uh, what are you doing studying German? Apparently these were not black approved activities. And then in high school, I remember listening to my uh, small peer group of geeks who were muttering, what's an honor roll student doing on the majorette squad? Uh, and then I joined academia, and the subtext for all of my colleagues raised eyebrows at that time was sort of, what's an intellectual doing dancing and dancing in sequence on the ballroom floor? And in the publishing world, I think murmurs could bubble up over poems, whenever I wrote poems about people like Robert Schumann or Albert Durer or Greek myths or Italian Renaissance, the implication being that an African-American poet had no business dabbling in European culture. So this latest book, Sonata Mulatica, which Marie mentioned, uh, might provoke another variation on that theme, late, but to wit, what's a contemporary <coughs> American woman poet doing tackling a bunch of alpha males in 18th and 19th century Europe? Well, the answer has always been the same, really. It's curiosity, uh, curiosity and an incredible zest to find out more about something, to which I would also add, you don't necessarily get to choose your loves, and you certainly don't get to choose the date of that meeting. And this book was a case in point. Uh, years ago, seems like years ago, but it wasn't that long ago. Um, a few uh, years ago, one evening, my husband and I were relaxing with a rented video. I was in the middle of copy editing uh, my, what was gonna be my next book, Poetry at that time, American Smooth. And we were relaxing with this video on Beethoven called Immortal Beloved. It's a biopic about Beethoven. And it's not bad, it's not great, it's just, just right for relaxing. When there came a moment in the movie, just a little, a few seconds, where Beethoven walks across the room, and there's a group of young musicians waiting to play for him. And among all of these eager Viennese is a young 
black man with a violin tucked under his arm. And I turned to my husband and I said, what was that? Uh, I've heard of colorblind casting, but this is a little stretching a little far. And then I went immediately to the, uh, to the computer and Googled black violinist Beethoven. And up came, at that time, just one short entry. And uh, it told me his name, George Augustus Paul Green Bridge Tower, violin prodigy during the reign of King George IV. And he was the son of a Polish mother and a father who called himself the African Prince. That was pretty cool. And, but most importantly, he had inspired Beethoven to write his violin uh, sonata in A major, opus 47, the one that we know as the Kreutzer. And he premiered it in Vienna with Beethoven at the piano in 1803. And that certainly got my interest, my curiosity, but um, I had copy editing to do, so it took another year before I could get back to the notes that I scribbled down and thought, what am I going to do with this? The story wouldn't let me go. It wasn't that uh, you know I set out saying I'm going to write a bunch of poems. It just wouldn't let me go. I didn't know how to do it. The question for me was why was Beethoven only why was Bridge Tower known only to a few musicologists and historians and evidently the scriptwriters of that movie that had flashed across the screen 200 years later, and why was this sonata familiar to me and others? by this entirely different name, dedicated to the French violinist Kreutzer, who had never played it, and actually said it was impossible to play, it was unplayable. So I began snuffling through old books, thank you, interlibrary love. <laughs> and I dug up a few more tidbits, each one more puzzling and wonderful than the last, that the diary of Queen Charlotte's wardrobe keeper she kept a diary, not only reported on prevailing fashions of the day, but also described the exploits of a flamboyant African prince and his violin playing son. And that among Beethoven's uh, papers was a scribbled note, which when you translate it, means, says, hey, Bridge Tower, let's go grab a beer. <laughs> and that Beethoven shredded the original dedication, which read, for the mulatto, Bridge Tower, grand pal and composer. And then he did this after Bridge Tower evidently made a saucy remark over a girl. And so for all those naysayers who had quizzed me in the past, I now had an answer. This girl who was learning German and playing the cello and doing all these strange things had been only preparing for this new quest to recover George Bridge Tower's life and put it in verse. Both the history with the capital H, the history of grand exploits of, of archives and marble busts, and the history of, with the small h, the individual litanies of achievements and failures, casual beers, and deplorable jokes. And still there were moments when I was working on this book when I had to ask myself, what's a poet doing studying musical scores or following Napoleon's exploits in advances on a pushpin map, plopping down a body farce in the middle of the, this group of lyrical poems? And the only answer I can give you is that even though I've been writing for half a century, that sounds horrible. Um, <laughs> but really, it's true, after half a century now, and I still can't tell you exactly what poetry is, and I can't predict the multitudes it, it can contain. When I was poet laureate, I got a letter from a young mother who described poetry this way. She said, poetry is making the language your own, which I think is pretty good, but I'll add this one sentence to it. Poetry is making the language your own so that for a moment, a stranger can find herself humming along with your words. Thank you.